Yeah, okay. So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to have you all here at the first session of Our Ladies Pune chapter. Um, a little uh, background for this Our Ladies Pune chapter. Uh, we recently had our kickoff meet uh, earlier this month, and uh, uh, many of you were not present for the, that meeting. I can see a couple of repeating faces, so welcome again. Um, our Ladies Pune chapter is uh, started with an aim to uh, give incentive to women users in R. Uh, uh, I uh, see in lot of uh, local meetups in uh, Pune that uh, uh, we see a very few women attending those uh, data science R or Python meetups. And this platform is basically to make uh, the uh, women who use are more visible to a larger group of audience so that it incentivizes new people coming into this field and uh, makes them feel comfortable. Uh, today for the first uh, lecture of this uh, Our Ladies Pune chapter, we have with us Dr. Suzanne Holmes. Uh, she is trained in French School of Data Analysis and uh, she has been working in non-parametric multivariate statistics applied to biology since 1985. She has taught at MIT, Harvard, and was an associate professor of biometry at Cornell before moving to Stanford in 1998. She created the Thinking Ma Matters class, breaking codes and finding patterns, and likes working on big, messy data sets. Her theoretical interests include applied probability, Monte Carlo Markov chains, graph limit theory, differential geometry, and topology of space of phylogenetic trees. She wrote the, modern, uh, she wrote the book Modern Statistics for Modern Biology and teaches the material as a crash course regularly. Her current focus is improving the statistical analysis and uh, reproducibility of data in perturbation studies of human microbiome. Uh, so when she uh, uh, was uh, when she announced on her Twitter handle that she is visiting Pune uh, for a workshop uh, directed at a biologist, uh, and she connected with uh, uh, our ladies Pune that if uh, such kind of a talk can be arranged, we were more than glad to host her for our inaugural session of our ladies Pune. And uh, welcome, Dr. Holmes. We are very happy to have you here. And uh, let's begin the talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, as um, they say here, good evening. To good evening to one and all. And uh, I hope that <coughs> my web interference won't go on like that. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do was present some of the work. So I've been an R user ever since R existed because I was an S user before. And I think it's R is a wonderful community um, of data scientists. And we develop tools. And this is going to annoy me infinitely. So I'm going to get rid of it as soon as I can. Uh, so I'm going to turn off the internet. Sorry about that. Um, so the the idea behind um, Our Ladies is to have a community events where we just show um, some of the tools, some of the things that we care about, some of the things that we do. And it's not a very academic talk. So I didn't try to make it so there's complicated statistics or mathematics. It was just that it, this was work that was very motivated by um, my work with biologists. And biologists care about communicating um, results much more about than about the mathematics and 
um, networks turned out to be a really important component um, of trying to uh, analyze biological data. So the first most important graph that appears in um, Darwin's work in the origins of species is this tree, which is actually a um, phylogenetic tree of different species. And um, this is Darwin writing it down. And so a lot of what we do in biology involves both phylogenetic trees, which are graphs which are rooted, and um, networks which show interactions between proteins. And they're not very large, so you don't, it's not the size of sort of the social network or across the globe or something like that. So it's very easy to do the analysis using R, and it's very satisfactory to have um, this tool which allows to analyze non-standard data. So here is another example of a graph on which I worked. It's a subgraph of the immune system, and the nodes here, they are genes. And what's very specific about the type of graphs and networks I work on is that the nodes have a meaning and they're often very important in trying to understand um, the underlying structure. So the, the, these nodes um, represent a, a network which is involved in um, a modification of the immune system in cancer patients. And this graph, for instance, we call this a clique. This is a special kind of subgraph that we um, identify as something which is a sort of special signal in a graph. This is a, another graph which is created originally from a distance matrix. And it's a graph of all different, many different strains from a database on HIV strains. And these, this graph was created as what we call a minimum spanning tree. So when you have distances um, between different points, here the different points of the different strains, there's a tree that you can create, which is the tr a path that goes through all the different points, which just has minimum distance. And the min minimum spanning tree, it's not like the traveling sales problem, salesman problem. It's a very easy graph to make. It's very cheap. So this is the minimum spanning tree. And what we've done here is just colored um, all the different nodes according to countries. Now, you can't see very well when you just do the color according to countries. And it's sort of more satisfactory if you use the supplementary information, which was um, we knew where the geography of the countries are. And so this is actually a graph created with ggplot. And um, where we've done a couple of things to modify the, the graph, we jittered the points so that they're not all overlapping exactly at the capital of the country, which were the ordinary coordinates. And so here you have, you know, for instance, Canada. There are, you know, we jittered the points around here so that they all appear to be in different points. And here we have Sweden up here, and here South Africa. And what you can see is there is a lot of contagion or um, transmission of HIV strains across the world. And so it's definitely the case if you take the minimum spanning tree in the space of distances between DNA, you do have, um, you see that it's due to a lot of travel. And so you see this um, very highly connected parts of the world. Instead of everything being in their little war, you see that there, there's this transmission um, across many, many countries um, in, the, in this minimum spanning tree. So there are many examples um, of networks and trees, especially in biology where I work. We use metabolic pathways. Um, we have chemical metabolites. Those are very naturally coming in as graphs. But we also have, you know, interaction networks occur in communities. But also I've studied interaction networks in ants. And so we look at, you know, which ants communicate with other ants and what's the consequence of these interactions. 
And we do this actually by making videos of the ants. And then we make, once we have the videos, we identify which ants are interacting with which ones. And then we make the interaction graphs. And we follow them over time. So you have longitudinal analysis of graphs. And so graphs are, are, are interesting. In this talk, I'm just going to talk to you a, a little bit about some of the packages. And in particular, there's a specific package for doing trees called APE. And everything to do with phylogenetic trees that I do is based on that package, which was developed by Emmanuel Paradis um, in Montpellier. And the other packages are packages for doing graphs, which is sort of based on the foundation is a package called iGraph. But then there's GGraph and GGTree and GGNetwork, which are the, the recent generation of tools which are compatible with the idea behind ggplot. That is that you're going to make your graph by making layers so that you have a visualization which isn't set in stone, you can make it better every time um, by adding the layers on. And so I'm going to provide examples. One of the most important things in what I do is that the nodes of the graph are meaningful. So I often have labels on the nodes. Sometimes I have covariates on the nodes. And so let's look at, so the mathematics isn't coming up because of the internet. But you, you, it doesn't matter. I said it's not a math talk, so we'll deal without the LaTeX. Um, so the um, iGraph um, function, um, the iGraph package has functions which allow you to define graphs in many different ways. First of all, the simplest possible way to see it as is a matrix of two columns. And the columns um, just have the different edges of the graph. And it might be that your graph is not oriented, it's not directed. So the just one edge um, just means that it, you know, there's, a, there's a connection between and the one and the other. And so this is a, would be an undirected graph. It's given by these edges, and this is what it would look like. So as, um, as usual in R, what happens is many of the functions are inherit how they react to special classes of objects. So in this um, matrix object, which is a edge list, you can just tell iGraph, I'm going to make a graph from an edge list. So I'm going to do it from a matrix, which is the edges. And I tell it also that it's not directed, so directed equals false. And then I can just plot it. So the inheritance here tells us you can just plot the graph, and um, then you can put in you know, the size of the edges and the size of the nodes. And I have node labels, as I said, so it matters which order they came in. And here, each one of those has a node. So this is a small graph structure. And this same graph could also be characterized by its adjacency matrix. Um, and so we, we have different ways of encoding and storing it. Now, it turns out that if you have a graph on a large number of nodes, it's not economical to have the adjacency matrix because it would be um, the number of nodes times the number of nodes. So usually the edge list is the better way of putting it down. So the elements here are you know, the edges or the connections which, which link um, sometimes we call the graph, which is weighted and has lengths on the edges and um, annotation on the nodes, we have a tendency to call it a network because it's a bit more complicated than an ordinary mathematical graph. So here we have the adjacency matrix. And so this is the, um, the six by six matrix in this case because we had six nodes. And as I said, that's not economical, but we often store it that way when we're thinking about it as a 0, 1 matrix. And so this is what the adjacency matrix looks like. If I plot it, um, you know, this is, this is the, there's a 1 every time there's a connection. So that's easy. Now we do a lot of, you could do edge statistics and find out how many elements, how much information is there. 
Um, we use uh, very often sparse graphs in biology. So the encoding um, it uses or is based on the same idea as what's behind sparse matrix. That is, we don't want to make the full matrix. We are only going to identify the non-zero elements, and it gives a much cheaper way of encoding it. So we have these annotation variables that I'm going to add on. And then we have the question of graph layout. So graph layout is usually done following methods which are actually inspired from singular value decomposition and ordination techniques. That is, you want to spread out the points quite in a balanced way. And there are various options for that. And all of that is encoded in. So for instance, there's a very popular one called Fuchsterm and Rheingold. And that's a, a popular option. And we can see the graphs. Um, you know, that come out of that. Now I'm going to show you a um, particular type of graph which occurs um, a lot in ecology in which I work. And in those graphs are what we call bipartite graphs. And they're, zero, they're really zero, one tables. That is, in some sense, we're going to put in, you could imagine taking um, different locations. So. Darwin studied the finches in the Galapagos. And here we have the different islands where he was collecting the data. And then we have a dot every time a finch. Let's see if I can make it bigger. No, I can't. I won't. Um, so we can have uh, a dot every time a, a bird of this type was found in this island. And this is what we call a zero one table, incidence table. And you can make that into a graph, but the two factors that you have, the islands is the locations, and the birds are the species, they're of different type. So your graph is a little bit special, and we call this a, let's see, I can make this, oh goodness, uh, it's, it's called a bipartite graph because we have two pieces, two parts to it. And within one part, there are no connecting edges. So there are no edges between the sites. There are only edges between the taxa and the sites. So this is a bipartite graph. Um, and we use it a lot in trying to say you know, presence, absence, or uh, links between categories. And we can, we can plot it. And so this is one plot. And this is sort of the default plot if you don't tell it that it's bipartite. So this is obtained by writing um, here, plot the 0, 1 table, which is in the data finch, and then just um, color the labels. And we're coloring them according to the type, the taxa or the islands. And so this is what you get. Now that's a sort of a bit of a mess. And this is slightly better. So this is a graph that you get with a circular layout. And in this circular layout, I have the islands on the one hand, and then I have the type. And you see that some of the species, you can see very clearly that some of the species are rare. So the medium tree finch that you have, it only occurs in one island. And then other ones, the vegetarian finch, occurs in almost all the islands. So the degree are on the, on the taxa gives you all the information that you want. Another a very frequent use for us in biology using a graph is a Markov chain. And in this case, actually, it's a directed graph. That is, we have a graph that says here, I'm passing from T to A. And the probability of going from T to A is 0 0.1, but the probability of going from A to T is 0 0.3. So it doesn't have to be symmetric. The transition matrix doesn't have to be symmetric. And that just means that the stationary distribution won't be uniform. But this is, um, and here we have a state. The state C is an absorbing state. That is, once it gets into the state C, it's going to stay there. And again, the graph that we draw, um, it, it's done in, in R, and it's, uh, there's an underlying R graph strike structure, which is managed by the package Markov chain. 
It's very easy to plot. You just plot the graph, and you can put in um, a lot of information. Here I put as annotation the transition rates um, between the different nucleotides. And again, here's another example. These are transition rates between different phases um, of a cell. Uh, we use this particular one a lot. This is state types in the vaginal microbiome, which allow us to predict um, whether or not a woman might give preterm birth, that is, have her baby early. And that is, we can see um, that here we have a state which is much more unstable. It's actually a bad state. It's a state in which we have a much larger fraction of preterm birth. But again, you can see all the information in the graph just by looking at it. And the annotations here uh, are important, in particular this number. Yes. What are those states? There's the states of uh, microbiome. So my specialty and the reason I'm in Pune is I'm interested in the human microbiome. And um, we look at which bacteria are present in different areas of the body. And um, for women, we know how to diagnose uh, risks in pregnancy by looking at the bacteria in the vaginal microbiome. So we have this, uh, and we use next generation sequencing. And with the sequencing, we're able to see which communities um, the um, bacteria belong to. And in this state four is communities which is extremely diverse and uh, which is problematic for pregnancy. So we have diagnosed, the, the, the Markov chain is given to you by, um, we measure uh, the women over the whole pregnancy. And so we see the passage between the different states. And so this state four, this dangerous state, is the most unstable, so p women go in and out of that state um, if they're in, say, state one, for instance, it's a very safe state. They, say, they stay there. And so it helps us because if you can look early in the pregnancy and see a state four, you know that that's going to be problematic. So in some sense, it's a biomarker. And, uh, so. so the graphs are very uh, well represented by a typical ggplot setup because, of course, you have layers. And here I had in my layer, this was the immune um, interaction network for certain genes. And here we had here this clique um, where we had different chemokines. And they, they, these are important in the immune system. So you can ask, there's a clique-like structure. And we can ask, you know, this subnetwork whether it has a, uh, is it sort of optimal in predicting a difference between cancer and non-cancer? And that's originally how we had it. That is, that network came from, we had a laundry list of genes which are overexpressed in a condition. And that laundry list isn't so meaningful. So in various kind of experiments where we look at gene expression, you often get a list. These are the most expressed. These are the most abundant. And a laundry list is just not useful because you don't know how far down the list to go, and it doesn't have any biological meaning. So the big progress is to make that list into a network. And in order to do it, what we do is we take a skeleton of all known association of genes. So it's quite a loose network. And happily, there's a database called String, which provides such a network. And so we have all potential connections. And then we map onto them, say, um, a weight which is inversely proportional to the p-value. And we try and find the subgraph which has the biggest score. And that subgraph is the center of perturbation. And that's how we found that, um, that's how we found that network. So it's a, what we call a significant subgraph. And it's done as an optimization problem. It's actually hard in some sense because it involves a knapsack problem, which is you have to find a collection on the graph which gives the highest score.
but you don't want to do all the inventories of all the possible subsets, subgraphs. Um, this is available in Bioconductor in a package called Bionet, where we use this known skeleton graph and we map the p-values onto it. And this is just a few lines of how it's implemented. So we have this library Bionet, and then we have the database and the data. And it's just a few lines to create the edges uh, of all the network. And we fit a model for the p-value, so, and that fits pretty well. And so we look at that, and this is the subgraph that we get. So this is actually a subgraph of the most perturbed between cancer and control patients. And compared to the original list, it's much more meaningful. And there's actually added value to it because if you took a list of significant genes, you have a couple here, like this white one, which is neither over or under expressed, but it's a very important connecting component. So it's very important in the graph of relations, but it doesn't go up or down. So you wouldn't have detected its importance if you just taken the list of most significant. So again, the graph informs the meaning um, to sort of a statistical test in a very interesting way. So this has been uh, very important in understanding um, functional relationships, and all of this you know, is available in R. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about evolution and how we build um, phylogenetic trees. So trees, um, they're just rooted binary um, trees with labels only at the bottom. So we actually only know the existent species, and we don't know the inner nodes. So building these trees, if you do it in a non-parametric way, we just, it's equivalent to doing, um, just minimizing the path, but you're allowed inner nodes, which are like what's called Steiner points. Um, and so that's one method for building the phylogenetic tree, and it's a parsimony tree. And there are also other methods which are the tree that makes the data the most likelihood. That's called the maximum likelihood tree. So here are two examples of trees. Um, one from XKCD and one from Haeckel, who predated um, Darwin and had already, although he didn't understand about evolution, he did understand about classification. So we use trees for classification in the genetic um, setting, but also in the language setting. So there are um, trees um, in the history of languages. So this tree is a phylogenetic tree of languages it has a small difference in the tree of different species. There's no difference between the left and the right as you go down. In linguistics, there's the ancient form and the new form. And there's one on the left and one on the right. So the trees are asymmetric in the siblings, how they're defined. This tree I like a lot because I like the author of this tree. This was a linguist. Um, who used to study ancient languages, but he wrote a lot of books in which he made up his own languages, and that's Tolkien. So that tree comes from Tolkien. So the example that I showed you earlier on, I study one of the important phylogenetic trees that we need to work with is the tree of HIV strains. So what happens in the phenomena of um, evolution of viruses is, first of all, it's extremely rapid. It's over a very short period of time. Here we have um, the evolution of various kinds of eight, um, versions of monkey um, virus, SIV, and HIV, which is for humans. And then we have this branching event, and it's through um, looking at the DNA that we are able to time, in some sense, this branching event to be around uh, probably the 19, some, some, somewhere between 1935 and 1950. But we work a lot with this package, APE, that allows us to make, construct, and manipulate um, phylogenetic trees. So, for instance, 
um, one of the things which is important is to understand how mutation rates um, differ across the tree in the case where patients are taking drugs. So we study what happens where the mutations occur in the case of drug-resistant mutations for HIV. And again, this is a case where having a tool that estimates the tree and allowed to find the, the change in mutation rates has been very important. So we make models for evolution. Um, and I have this plot of the very flexible watches because, in fact, um, this is a case where the statistical model, which is Markovian, and which says that um, mutations occur consistency acro consist consistently across time, is completely wrong. That is, actually, we know that uh, mutations, there's no molecular clock. And mutations only, on average, occur um, consistently. But we do use the Markovian model because that's the only thing we know how to do. Otherwise, the model isn't identifiable. It becomes very complicated. So one of the ways of understanding a complicated process is actually to make fake data. So I do a lot of simulation because we have a lot of problems which we can't answer with analytics. So all we can do is say, OK, I'm going to play God. I'm going to pretend that this is my phylogenetic tree. So I start with something. I start with my model. And then I'm going to make up data according to that tree. So it's simulated em evolution. And the way it works, I put the tree on the side. I probably should have put it down. But here, we generate a random nucleotide, so ACGT. And then we make it change at random according to the length of the branch. So maybe it stays the same here. And then here, maybe there's a change. And so in that case, may there be something different for these three two points. And these would be the original version. And so you can do that many, many times very, very easily in R. So there's a package um, called Fangon, and, um, it, which allows you to simulate according to such a uh, model. And then I use the package ggtree just to make the point, just to make the tree. And then here, what I've done is I've s simulated. So this is simsec, which is just a simulation. And I can simulate according to this tree and make up data. So these data have been simulated according to this tree. And then I use that data to see if I can, my methods for estimating the tree are any good. So we do a lot of sort of modeling, simulation, and then going back to the origin. Um, and the, the phylogenetic trees are really important. So I said earlier, we want to estimate very often the phylogenetic tree. And actually, the parsimony tree is something which comes um, very naturally from mathematics. So it's the tree which is the minimum length. If you're, so it's not the minimum spanning tree because you're allowed to add in extra points. So in a minimum spanning tree, suppose I had points like this, um, like I just, those points 1, 2, 5, 6. Um, if I was doing the minimum spanning tree, it would just be something like this one. That would be the minimum spanning tree. Now here, I'm allowed to add in two extra points. So these are called Steiner points. And they correspond, in fact, to the ancestors. And so in that case, um, this is the Steiner tree. And so here, here, and here. And these are the ancestors. Okay, so th These are the ancestral points which aren't measured. You don't get to see them, but you get to infer them. You get so that's the parsimony tree. And that's a non-parametric method for estimating the phylogeny, which is very often used. And I said, we can use maximum likelihood. And there's a nice set of uh, functions in R which allow you to do that. And we can also do Bayesian posterior distribution on trees. And that's done with Monte Carlo Markov chain. And so here is an example of a tree. And then it was estimated on some data. And then we can go back and try and look at um, how sure we are about that. 
So this is the original data that we estimate the tree from. This is aligned data. And then we can just estimate the tree after we aligned it. And again, it's just a couple of lines of R. So it's really nice to have all of these tools together. So often we combine the tree with other data. And we make networks. And so that's what I do in my study of the microbiome. So this is supposed to represent the same data set with all different facets. And so this data um, becomes in samples. So we know something about the samples. We know which subject they came from. And maybe they're dependent. We have several samples from the same patient. But then we have the different phylogenies of the bacteria which are present. And then we have them in different abundances. So we make heat maps. So I made a package um, called PhiloSeq, which, is, which benefits from more evolved data structure than just plain R. It belongs to what's called bioconductor. And in bioconductor, we try to make it so that we have extra um, structure built in. So these are what we call S4 objects. And in it, I have the matrix of the data. But we also have um, the phylogenetic tree. And so that's a partic particular object. And we can incorporate all of that into one. And so this library, PhiloSeq, allows you to combine. And then you don't have to worry about, if you want to take a subset, how do you drop part of it? Everything is taken care of. And um, that's something that I've worked on over the last eight, nine years. And we were trying to get biologists engaged and using this. And that's when we thought, well, we should use Shiny. So if any of you have um, some experience with R, you know that over the last few years, there's been a real push to try and make tools which are interactive. So we made this version of this command line library, which made it easier for biologists to use it. And so here, this is Shiny PhiloSeq. So it's a Shiny interface. So it's not a command line in R. And this type of tool we found you know, we're the data scientists, OK? We know how to analyze data. We know how to use R. But often, we have users who don't know how to use R. Uh, we still want to show them how they could manipulate or look at their data. And so sometimes, we have to make um, interfaces which are just browser-based. And so Shiny is a good example of that. So here, I've selected a data set. and um, here, we're just looking at the number of reads, but I could look at other parts of it. I could look at what the sample data looks like for this data. And so it's showing me all the different components of my complex um, elements, but without having to know how to write down you know, the access function. So I, I have the sample data. I have the OTU table. I have all the elements here. And so we can display that. But I can also do various kinds of filtering on the data and simple manipulations without using a, without using a interface which requires people to know everything about the command line. So we found this tool to be, we call it our gateway dr drug to R. That is, the biologists use this. Then they find it frustrating because they want to do a little bit more. And they want to change the figures. And then we say, well, you have to learn R. So then they learn R. So, but it's been good for us. And, and we, we like the way it's come out. So for instance, here, if I wanted to look at the diversity, um, there are various measures of diversity of the data. And uh, we can just look at them by choosing. Um, here, the diagnosis. And I wanted to do the shape, and it's not very good. I'd say that maybe I need to make the shape maybe a little bit bigger. And um, the label larger. And just for the, for the samples, it's not perfect. 
So these are what we call alpha diversity measures. And so they are measures for the different samples of the diversity of those samples. So it's interesting because diversity is not always associated to health. In the case of the vaginal microbiome I was talking about earlier on, diversity is a bad thing. That is, if you have a very diverse community, it's pathological. It means you're in state four. Um, in the case of cancer and tumor um, environment, uh, it's not like that. That in general, um, the diversity is lower, um, is less healthy. Um, for the gut, for instance, when we're studying obesity, again, um, diversity is a sign of good health. So you have these situations, but we do like to have summaries like diversity, which allow you to, ma to make conclusions. So we use that a lot. And the other type of plots that we make a lot of, we like to use um, multidimensional scaling or ordination to bring down the dimensionality of the problem. So here we have many choices of distances. I'm just took one of them, which is the Bray-Curtis distance, which is a distance between proportions in the samples. And um, I'm just showing you, in some sense, um, the different points. And then I could choose, say, um, again, I'd like to choose the diagnosis as the color. And so just to see if there was a relationship in the two-dimensional plot so in this case, um, this is a two-dimensional PCOA plot. And then we have a couple of points for which we don't know the diagnosis. So they're in blue. And then we have the red ones, um, which are actually, in this case, the healthy ones, and then the green ones. There's not a big separation. That is, the diagnosis doesn't seem to be very related to the different communities, at least not in a way which is very, very we do have more green points on the right. So there's a slight tendency to be on the right. And then here, you know, we have this all-important scree plot at the bottom where you can decide how many axes you need. And so in this case, we have two, and then there's a drop. So you're perfectly happy to make a PCOA plot in two dimensions. So this, this tool took all the functions that we made in PhiloSeq and just made them so that they're much better to organize and much easier to use. Um, the other point about this tool, so for instance here, this is a case where we're looking at networks. And so um, it might be that I want to look at the Jacquard distance, presence, absence, between different samples. So in this case, the um, samples, I could use the label again to be the... <coughs> the diagnosis at, I've lost it, there we are. Uh, it's not giving me the color, right? All right. Um, but we've connected points in the network here which have a certain level of similarity. So it's the case that um, very often, the data don't come naturally as graphs or networks, but you can make them into graphs if you have two points, they're two samples, and then you say, okay, if they have a lot of sharing, if they're sharing a lot of um, bacteria in common, then um, they're at a small distance in terms of um, what we call beta diversity, so that they have a small distance in, in the space of the taxa. And so here, this is what these edges mean. We've connected ones which have s very similar um, makeup. And so this is, a, in some sense, like a co-occurrence graph. And so we could make a co-occurrence graph. Now, I could make it um, a little bit more. There we are. So here, by changing the threshold, and this is one of the big advantages of having this be interactive, because you can just change the threshold until you have the sort of level of interconnection between the samples that you expect. And this is 
been developed using what's called D3, which is a JavaScript library, which is quite satisfying in some sense for the people who, because you can sort of make it move. So it's very interactive. The D3, and so D3 was written um, by Mike Bostock, and it's standalone. It doesn't have anything to do with R. But the people who developed Shiny made a set of bridge tools that go between R and D3. So here, this D3 network is done through that bridge of tools. So we didn't actually have to program in D3. In the JavaScript library, we just used some of the available tools. And this has been quite satisfactory for us because in some sense, you, you have a, a nice way of interacting with your graph. And here, you know, the labels, unfortunately, they all come in in different colors. But I can, I can go in and I can find out what the diagnosis is. It's hidden. But if I go to the point here, tumor, tumor, no diagnosis, tumor, and so on, we can look at the underlying variables um, in this network. Now, the dual network, this is the network of samples, but you can also make the network of the different species. And, uh-oh, there we go. And so this is trying to understand the community of species as they interact with each other. And so in this case, we have species which co-occur with many other species. So actually, it's a much more interconnected graph. And here we have the coloring is actually according to the different um, types, um, genus. And you can actually interact and find out which ones are which, such as Clostridia and so on. So it's satisfactory for the user to have a lot of the information, which they don't have to type in queries for, but they can just look at it interactively. So this is, that's, the, um, that's what we developed in Shiny PhiloSeq. Now, one of, the, one of the things which is really nice about R is that you have reproducible research. So we try to make it so that when you're doing an interactive session, it also keeps a track of what you're doing. So in that case, we have what we call provenance tracking, so it tells you you know, these are the list of filters and things that you did to the data so that afterwards when you get into a certain state and that you like the graphic, you can retrieve it later on or you could even have the R code that went with it. So that's the use in some sense of um, shiny PhiloSeq and ha how it works. Now, from a more statistical viewpoint, um, you know, I talked to you earlier on about the minimum spanning tree. Here, you know, these are the minimum spanning tree and how we created it. Now, statistically, we can use the minimum spanning tree on a graph to test whether the edges are connected to some factor that we're interested in. So this is a question of, you know, doing statistics on the graph. And I'm going to show you um, a little example. But I'll, first of all, I'll show you how it was inspired. So the test that I'm going to talk to you about was developed by Jerry Friedman. And his inspiration was the runs test of Wald Wolfowitz. So it's a non-parametric test. And suppose that I only had, for the time being, one variable, one covariate. And I want to see whether the two groups, there's red and blue, whether one group is larger than the other. So it seems as if you know, there the are quite a few of the red ones are on the left, the blue ones are on the right. So you want to find out, and you can do a non-parametric test. And the Von Wolfowitz test, what it does is it counts the number of times that you have runs. So here, that means that I have a segment with two edges, and they're the same color. And so here I have one, here I have two, and there I don't have one. There I have one of each color, okay? And here I have these ones and these ones, these ones. These are all the same color. So you see I do have runs, so I have a lot of edges. Now what Jerry did was he extended it to the case where you have a high level 
um, high dimensional data and you can make a minimum spanning tree. So in this case, we have a whole set of mice and they're measured across time and we made the distance in terms of the difference between the bacterial composition in these mice and we connected them using a minimum spanning tree. Okay, so this is the minimum spanning tree as it's created in R and here using GG network. So this is the minimum spanning tree and we've colored, as I said, what I'm in interested in is the nodes on the graph. I've colored the graph nodes according to the mouse, okay? So in this case, there are two things about the mouse. There's the identification of the mouse and then there's the litter. And so the litter is actually the shape. I've used it to represent um, the triangles are one litter and the round ones are another litter. And the question that we had about this was, is there more sharing across litters? Now, you can do an ordinary test just to see whether the color, you know, you could say, is the subject to subject um, sharing much higher than across subjects? And that's, that would be done just by counting the number of edges in the graph that have two nodes of the same color. And so here you see there are, it just appears obvious, you know, most of the sharing here is the same color. And so um, Jerry had the idea of making a permutation test to do this. And all you have to do is reassign the colors at random and count how many, how many share um, the same color or both edges if they were assigned at random on the same graph. And um, so you can see you know, and you do that many, many times, a thousand times, and that allows you to see whether or not, you know, you have a significant amount of homogeneity inside your graph. And so in this case, for the color we do, and then we conditioned out the color and looked at the litter, and we also saw that. So for the color here, you have the observed number of pure edges, edges where you have um, the same color on either, either node. And then you have the histogram of um, what you would get under the permutation distribution. So there's no doubt about the p-value here. It's very significant. Okay, so the p-value is very small. And you can have different choices for the... I did the minimum spanning tree, but that's what is nice about doing graphs in R. You have all kinds of other types of... Um, networks, you can have a co-occurrence network, you can have k-nearest neighbors, there are many methods to do it. And so this is, a, this is a connection network with using the Jacquard distance, which is a co-occurrence network. And we still have a lot of homogeneous um, edges, uh, edges with the same color. And here the, the question about the litter is, you know, if you take out the fact that they are the same um, mouse, can we look up across different litters? So in this case, we have litter one and litter two, and we're just going to permute the litters and see whether there's a significant amount of sharing conditional on the fact that you have the same mice. And so we made a little package which allows you to do this type of um, friedman rafsky test on graphs, and it turns out that it's very popular. People like it because it's non-parametric, but it's, you can have highly multivariate data um, and still create the minimum spanning tree for those data. And this is the permutation distribution. And now, it's not quite as extreme as in the case of the mouse, but it's still, quite, it's still significant. Um, it's just one which is like that. Now, I showed you one graph, which was the sharing, the graph, um, we connected two samples if they shared a lot, but you could also make um, the taxa and make edges between the taxa if they sh um, have many of the samples which share those samples. But I'm going to end here. Um, I just wanted to show you some examples of how you can use graphs to communicate and also you know, the example of shiny phyloseq. I think it's worth investing a little bit of time in doing shiny, if you have to communicate, that is, um, 
my postdoc who wrote PhiloSeq with me, Joey, now works in a company. And the main thing that he develops is these shiny interfaces where he writes a lot of code in R, and then he makes it so the output all goes to a browser. And some of the tuning parameters you can just make as little sliders and so that the people who don't know how to use R, they can still interact with the data. So I think that that's something which is useful. Um, we use, I showed you how we define simple graphs and annotated graphs, but also how you can use graph information like the skeleton graph of the gene interactions in order to get um, more meaningful results than just a list of most significant things. And so I think graphs are very useful. And uh, so um, now the, the packages I used and I showed you here, um, I used iGraph and GG Network. There's another package called GGraph now, which it works pretty well. Um, I showed you BioNet and PhiloSeq. And here, there's a whole list under the bioconductor views of graph and network-based packages. So there are lots of resources for, for, for using graphs already in R. And uh, he, I'll put up some references. Now, I put up all my talks. So I'll put this up on my website so that if you want to click through and, and try it out um, yourself, you can do it. Thank you. And they don't have to be about graphs and networks. They can be about anything, about using R, about R. Yes?